Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I'm your host, Federica Bressan, and our guest today is Bruno Jele. He lives in Switzerland. He has more than 30 years' experience in building up service companies in Switzerland and development cooperation projects in South India. Bruno is chief expert for higher education on vocational training in the field of mediamatics in Switzerland and technical manager of the digitization project in the Art Museum of Basel. Welcome, Bruno. Hello, Federica. I'm very happy to have you on the show because since when I met you a few years ago at a conference in Brussels on digitization and preservation of cultural heritage, um, I have grown fonder and fonder of your activity because not only you're active on so many fronts and internationally, actually intercontinentally, but you always um, keep like attention to people uh, at the core of, of what you do, even when it involves, um, well, technology or um, other fields. I'm especially interested in technology. So, um, to begin with, I would like you to tell us a little bit of what the BJ Institute, which you're a founder of, BJ, of course, stays for Bruno Jele. What does it do? What kind of platform it is? Well, BJ Institute, I started... Uh, because my wife told me I should name it that way. Um, <laughs> then it should <laughs> she, have had her name from. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. She was afraid that I will move away uh, if other people uh, are very eager to take over the activities as it happened sometimes in my life. Uh, so she said, uh, when, whatever you do, uh, make it in a way that you stand hand to person behind the activities and even if it becomes interesting in an in a economic way, don't move away, keep it on track. So the only way to prosecute this is if you make it in your name. So she told me, so call it BJ Institute. So about the activities, uh, I had, uh, I built uh, a company in Switzerland in the field of uh, media asset management. So we had customers such as Swatch or FIVA, or uh, other international organizations, companies. Uh, and we organized all their media data to be accessible by not more than a browser. I think we have been one of the first companies to use uh, only the browser for media data management, such as image data banks and things like that. So after a while, I felt my uh, contribution to the company, the time of the value of my contribution to the company, even being a founder, may be over because now it's needed for the demand of the customers and for the prospects of the, the team. They have to scale up, so they want to become international. They want to have customers in the United States, in the European Union, all over the world. And so you have to to, to rework all the processes you have to build up a marketing department and things like that. So, and yeah, being successful is work. Hard oh. work, <laughs> really hard work. So I may be more of a pioneer. I can do the things until they really work. But when it comes to the moment when you have to scale it, I felt that I have a few weaknesses. I find it very difficult to motivate myself in the needed, uh, on the needed level to commercialize the thing. So I thought uh, going to these fields where you really have the, the heart, so it's more in uh, uh, encouraging young people to, to, uh, to learn, to make experience, to build uh, trust, to build on their own experience rather than to run behind some theoretical concepts. Well, I know that you have started several times in your life yes. as a pioneer, something from scratch, and it, it normally became successful. It's very interesting, no, this no, dynamic. No, no, that, that may be the impression. I think you, ha mm -hmm. you have to do many tries, and at, at least the people see only what is successful. They don't see the many times you fail. Aha, uh -huh, that's deep. 
Well, let us take a step back to before the BJ Institute was founded. There is something fascinating about your profession that one doesn't learn right away. That it's something that I found very fascinating. And that is that your initial training was in photolithography. Correct. I find it fascinating because it's a profession uh, for which you have not received like two months training. It was a part of your life and it's a full profession. However, one that evolved through the years that was heavily impacted by the advent of digital technologies. Yeah, so the yeah. way one mm, performs that profession is not the same at all today. We know that you have successfully transitioned to, if we want, the digital world. But how has the process been? How has it been for you to receive that kind of training and then see what you knew in desperate need to be updated all the time? Yeah, that's an interesting point indeed. Um, when I was 16, I started in a, uh, an apprentice as a photolithographer in a small um, uh, lithographic company, and they have been specialized in uh, high quality reproduction of old cultural values. For example, uh, paintings in temples in Burma and Thailand, uh, Buddhistic and Hinduistic uh, image, uh, images, and reproduction in highest possible quality of historic books. So I had from the very beginning, uh, I was in contact with this type of uh, preservation of values from past culture, so somehow. But I made it to, I, I, it, the profession of lithographers are uh, equal to typographers. These are very proud uh, people, especially the Swiss lithographers with the cartography, I mean, making maps and things like that. Uh, and they have been very proud and they wanted to earn good money. And they said, the way we can do that is we have to deliver the best quality worldwide then automatically our work will have a value and we want to have a share of this value. So they understood that uh, it's a small group uh, and they cannot work each one against the other, but they have to support the others in the aim to get the best possible knowledge about everything concerning the profession. So they have been uh, pride people. And, you know, there are even some uh, rituals when they accept a young professional to be a lithographer. So this is building identity. Right. So uh, even with 20, you know, they, they put they push you underwater. And when you come up, you are one of them. Wow, like, like, a, like a society. Like a society, indeed. So I learned uh, from 16 to 20 that doing something is not only earning money with something. It's taking responsibility for the knowledge of the, of the past in that field and guiding young people to take it somehow serious that it is building identity what you're doing. So technological change, photolithographer means being a lithographer with photographic uh, material. Previously, there was the stone lithographers, so they had to uh, paint uh, on, a, on a lithographic stone. This was the first real photographic reproduction technology. So you could print maybe 1,000, maybe 2,000 copies if you do everything right, and then your painting aside wrong, all the stone will be washed away by the, by the physical uh, use uh, while printing. And so <clears throat> everything evolves. So instead of painting, you used photographic material. So it was not very uh, surprising that after photography, new technology comes up. What was interesting to me was the experience by this uh, way of social organization of the trade, that uh, the, the pride that what you do, you do it the right way and you try to understand uh, your social responsibility. I mean, if we look today in the way we do our job, you have so many aspects. You have an economical aspect, 
to earn your money for yourself, maybe for your family. But then you have a certain responsibility for the experience which is in that profession. And you have a certain responsibility for ecological uh, aspects. So if you reduce everything only to a commercial, to a higher and higher type of doing your job, then you're very poor uh, if you compare it to an understanding that in a society with so many specialized activities, you are a specialist in, in one of the specific fields and you have certain responsibility as well. You have a social responsibility, you have an ecological and economic responsibility, but that's a wide uh, field of understanding your trade. We all are specialized somehow, but can we take responsibility for what we're doing? Usually not. So I was interested in, so that I built my own company in that field, uh, to, to actively uh, participate in the migration to the digital age of this uh, traditional trade. I like how you approach this concept of responsibility. And I wonder if it is possible that the reduced responsibility that we see in workers today, it seems so generalizing as opposed to in the past, may be laid at the feet of something that's positive and that is optimization. Do you think that it is possible to have a positive narrative around this? And that is... We are part of larger, complex processes, and for them to work smoothly, we have to make each step less complex. So each individual person who is part of the larger scheme needs to take less decisions. And this under the name of optimization, which I understand is a tricky word because it can be seen as something positive as it is, but with this negative possible meaning of maximizing productivity for its own sake, maximizing profit. So to make the process better, not like because the work calls for it or because it will make the people feel better, but because of maximizing profit. However, let's keep the positive Uh, meaning of optimization. Do you think that it is possible that responsibility has been lifted off most workers under the name of this, the process of optimization? No, I don't. I don't think really. I think as if you look at the culture and the society as a whole, there is the same responsibility for everything. The question is, where are what decisions taken and where is your part of the same so if you if you uh, um, make a company and if you are chairman of a company obviously you have clearly responsibilities but if you are uh, in training and uh, education obviously you have some responsibility so i think it's a type of illusion that we have less possibilities to in a, in a way to to define the way we understand and we act as professionals in our specific field i think it's a question of whether we are aware of that and how we use it and often i feel uh, those people who understand this they are somehow qualified to take responsibilities for others but if you ignore it obviously you're not prepared to take responsibilities for processes and for other people maybe there is an, an interesting historic uh, point when i was in my apprentice we reproduced books um, ancient books of some value one of the books was uh, the book binders identity or the book binders uh, law you can say interestingly <coughs> i mean it was uh, about 1680 or something <coughs> so in it was not just the state law what was relevant for the professionals the state law uh, pointed out you shouldn't kill you shouldn't you shouldn't steal you have to do this and that but 
it is forbidden to act like this. But this was the same for everyone. But bookbinders had their own moral. They had their own, uh, you shouldn't go for prostitutes, for example, was written there and things like that. So it was a law that made you to be a bookbinder, a moral to act as a bookbinder. And that was surprising to me with 18 years when I read that thing, how is it possible? Uh, but historically, to work in a trade means to have a certain responsibility uh, for the trade. And that responsibility was not connected purely to economic decisions. Wow, this really sounds like something that comes from a past long gone. Yes, but maybe maybe this uh, way of looking at the things could be relevant in future if we think of artificial intelligence and robots uh, and what makes us as humans different to artificial steered robots. It's maybe coming back in another way. I think the longer the more, I think the social organization of professionals in their trades becomes more important as more and more work can be done by robots and can be uh, automatically steered. So I wouldn't say that this is just uh, something from the past. It could, it's maybe a concept which is interesting for the future as well. Speaking of the future, Technoculture, this podcast, is about technology, but it's also about humans. And what you just said triggered this association in my mind. And that is to the fast pace at which technology seems to be advancing. Mm -hmm. It's part of what I like to call techno-rhetoric. And that is some statements we take for granted, like technology advances fast. And a consequence of that is that we struggle to keep up. Mm -hmm. And in the job market, for example, the mantra is this keep learning, lifelong learning, which in itself doesn't sound bad. Actually, it's a good thing. But it's under this sort of anxiety, a sort of pressure to keep moving forward, forward, because technology advances and it's like we struggle to keep up. And I take issue with that rhetoric because I think that who makes technology? Humans do. And why? To make our lives easier. So it seems to me that your profession is an interesting example of a group of people that saw their craft uh, change in the methods and uh, instruments beyond their will. It's just what it was. You had to drop old habits and learn new skills. But because as a group, you had a tradition, you had a culture, if I may say, you had a code of honor that helped to maintain the people on top of the changes. Like, we master the changes. We don't chase them. Am I getting a right impression from the group of professionals, of uh, lithographers, bookbinders? Yeah, yeah, I think it, it is because of the pride of these people and they understood uh, that they are um, real professionals to publish or to multiply visual content. So the, the first way to, to uh, publish pictures in high quality was uh, uh, in many numbers I, uh, to multiply was lithography. So you find old lithographic pictures in highest quality. They used maybe 10, uh, 10 stones, 10 colors. And uh, it was not just a standardized process. So these people have been really artists. Uh, but what they, uh, maybe I speak about like all the lithographers things that way, they are not existing anymore. But I can only speak individually about my, what I learned and why it was for myself important to have that roots in tradition. I think uh, what we are doing is less defined by technology. It's defined by our understanding of what we are doing. So lithographers have been uh, specialists 
to publish visual content. Now, what I learned by digitization, and especially in the, in the last few years, the, the problem moved from a purely technical problem to a legal problem because intellectual property. So being uh, an expert in publishing visual content, we have to know about even the legal aspects. Otherwise, we are not really specialists up to date to act as specialists with technical and legal and all obstacles when you want to publish visual content. So everything is in transformation. And I think the as a general tendency, we can say everything's everything in technical sense becomes easier and everything in legal aspects becomes more complex. Mm -hmm. So the legal aspects and implications of your profession were not as problematic as they are today in the digital world, so to speak. Now, imagine if you have to draw on a stone for every color you print. So if you print, for example, in 10 colors a map, you need 10 stones in the original size of the map. And you have to paint uh, reverse So, side wrong. You cannot even read it if you are not a professional. And it must have register. Can you imagine? So, the technical complexity was the protection even of the content because no one else could do it unless he controls uh, the tools and the machines. So, the weight of the, the, the lithographic stones for one map was maybe two, three hundred cages, maybe five hundred cages. Uh, just to wait what you have today in bits and bytes on a hard disk, because you have to, to use stones to paint on for every color in the original size. And these stones had to be stabile even, even under pressure when you, when you put the color on and uh, put the paper in contact to the color on your drawing on the stone. So that was a protection by for the trade, the technical complexity and the skills, obviously the skills you need to paint on a stone and to control all the chemical process to bring it to the paper was the protection. Now, all this protection is gone away. You have in every smartphone, you have mm -hmm. a, a 12 megapixel or 20 megapixel camera. And if it's a better one, you have quite good results on it. So everything becomes very handy. At the same time, the legal question, are you allowed to do so? Are you allowed to publish? Are you allowed to take a picture from the same? Are you allowed to publish the same? It becomes uh, more and more complex. So reflecting on these things is how you got involved with copyright issues. Yeah, the first, um, the first time... I heard about it and I couldn't believe it was uh, with the Chaos Computer uh, Congress in Hamburg. It was mid 90s. And I had the opportunity to hear Wow Holland. Uh, he was able to speak just one and a half hour without break about this issue, mm -hmm. about this topic. And it was very fascinating for me because he could, he explained that when in the former Uh, uh, communistic uh, DDR uh, they had a first May uh, celebration and they sung the international the internationale on the roads they had to pay uh, royalty to the owner of the intellectual property so that was amazing for me wow. I couldn't believe it but it is a fact uh, excuse me Is intellectual property, IP, the same thing as copyright? Yeah, IP is a little bit more than just the copyright. So patents, for example, are an issue of uh, intellectual property, while copyright is uh, limited to copy something what is published. Okay, so intellectual property means that I've had an idea and the idea is protected. But I can have an idea and you can copyright it. Yeah, ideas. Mm. 
on its own, uh, as per my understanding, are not protected. But if there is a technical, a product, there is a technical aspect of how you transform your idea into a technical solution, for example, it can be a patent. But patent, you have to register, and the patent is limited in time, while the copyright is, uh, as per the law, as we have it in Switzerland, Germany, and I think all of Europe, is by the creative content is protected for every person who is creative. I mean, a very strange and idealistic concept. The the, the only thing is it's not working in reality. That's maybe the disadvantage of that concept. You know, in principle, it seems something that makes complete sense. It makes sense to want to protect the product of somebody's intellect so that other people will not wildly capitalize on it. It makes sense. So what is it that doesn't work in reality? What's wrong about it? Well, like all the intellectual property, it's uh, fostering the development towards monopolies because it's not wrong that the creative person has got a right on his creative content. But the problem is this, uh, this right to publish usually is handed over to publishing houses or to collectors or to uh, companies like uh, uh, image banks who buy it and who sell it uh, with uh, with big organizations. So, the, as I told, the, the concept behind this very idealistic and nice idea, but the question is, how does it show up in reality? And now uh, all um, intellectual property is fostering the monopolization uh, in companies with big capital and long after the death of the creative person. For example, now, you have uh, 70 years after uh, the, the artist dies, still the copyright is active. It, uh, and uh, gradually they are prolonging mm -hmm. uh, that duration of protection. So no one can say that you are interested and it's, it's supporting your creativity 69 years after after you died. That's all the question of who gets the profit of the monopole. That's the main question. The main problem is these are all monopole rights. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, that's fine. Another problem is it's not just if you write a book of 700 pages. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, for sure, it should be protected. I agree. If you make an illustration, a scientific illustration or an art illustration, your right should be protected to, to earn money with the same. That's not the, the issue. The issue is that not the whole uh, Werk, as we say in German, artwork as a whole is protected. If you write a composition in music, the problem is not that the whole work of your composition is protected, but every element of it which has a certain level of creativity within is protected. And that leads to a situation where uh, I remember two examples. One was a, a, a YouTuber who put a video on YouTube collecting wild salad on a field. And he filmed what you can eat and how you can use it. And in the background, there was birds singing. Mm -hmm. Now, as he was, I don't know, it was maybe 15 minutes or something. So there was a lot of patterns of birds songs in the background. Yeah. And the video was blocked on YouTube because the patterns, you know, this, this robots for avoid misuse of intellectual property, they have to uh, uh, concentrate to to formulas uh, so it's not the music as a whole it's elements short snippets of music it's like your fingerprint is not as an image stored it's as a code mm -hmm. it's stored compressed as a, as a code but what was with the birds yeah so the birds created some patterns um, acoustic patterns 
which are similar if you cut it in small pieces to any type of composition. So this happens not once, this happens many times. And only those people who are aware of the, the problem with the intellectual property and the patterns understand that in future you have to be programmer and lawyer to be creative because the patterns you create may be already existing. Imagine you have a copyright law in Europe that all of your creative content is uh, protected by constitution. Mm -hmm. And this 70 years after you die, imagine how much creative content is protected and monopolized. What was made initially to protect mainly the publishing houses and not the, the creative people. I think the whole thing started with the, the uh, editor of uh, uh, Shakespeare. Because the creative people usually, they think, oh, what is there? I can create something new. But the, uh, the editors, the publishing houses, they are 100% relying on the monopole right to capitalize the creative content of artists. So that all evolved in a few hundred years, in two, three hundred years. An interesting aspect is the first copyright was, as per my knowledge, in, uh, in England uh, with the uh, publishing house uh, of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And so they tried, of course, to optimize the income by the monopole they had, I think, for... I don't know whether it was 10 years, something like 10 years or five years. And then it should fall into the public property, even the ideas, the concept, the text. In Germany, this concept was not there. So that leads to a situation where in England, the books have become very nice piece of artwork with uh, gold patterns uh, on the cover and very nicely uh, done, while in Germany there was such a competition from the paper making to the book binding to the printing process, even to the sales places for books. So that created uh, a situation that the competition made the German book printing uh, machine builders far more competitive than the British one, and so than the English one. So that's why uh, today with Heidelberger, Emma, and if you look at uh, what is existing in the field of printing, you'll find everywhere German companies as number one, because the competition created a situation where they had to be better. And in Germany, Germany became then the land of the, the writers and the thinkers, because everyone had access. Mm -hmm. It was not so much of an economic uh, problem because if you if you uh, work as a kitchen maid you cannot buy a, a book with a golden cover but maybe you have been able to get on very cheap paper without even binding a novel and uh, lend it to someone else and things like that so it was uh, more prominent in the public and the competition among the writers, the competition among machine builders, the, the competition among paper uh, makers became very intense. And obviously, the quality of the products improved in this process. So it, the concepts have side effects, which are out of focus of those who implement new laws. And I think now in the digital age, we are in a situation where the whole thing becomes more and more complex and side effects mm -hmm. may, may oversteering the wanted effects while implementing. So concepts have side effects. That's interesting. And indeed, I had never thought about it. Did I just hear you say that the introduction of a copyright in England, as opposed to in Germany, actually slowed down an entire sector of human activity. Is this what you actually just said? It's a big statement. Yes, yes. That's that's proven. That's proven. For example, we can have a look in another field. You see, the, the chemical industry in Basel 
is maybe world known with all this uh, medicine uh, producers in Basel and the chemical products producers such as uh, Sando and Sibagaygi historically and uh, Hofmann Laroche and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> so how it was possible that Basel became a hotspot? Interestingly, now Switzerland is uh, trying to get the best possible protection for intellectual property on patents. For example, we would have a free trade agreement with India, if not the chemical and the medical industry, the pharmaceutical industry from Basel wants to prosecute their intellectual property. Now, the whole story began because Basel is on the river of Rhine. And the river of Rhine is connecting, even for heavy loads, a good part of uh, northern Europe from Switzerland. So the Basel industry had their chance when there was a patent law in France and in Germany, but not in Switzerland. So they copied old protected products and have been able to sell it to French and Germany. So when they became strong and when they became leading companies, they themselves want to protect what was at the very initial stage, the chance for them even to get experience, to get into the market, to build the infrastructure. So I think that is the 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 overall image in the in the when you are no one and when you try to get your chance intellectual property is against you and when you are leading and when you try to extend the use of your monopole position you try to extend all ways of intellectual property whether you're an artist or a chemical producer whether you're in pharmaceutical or take any field and you will see the same picture. So today it's a protection of Western states against Eastern upcoming states such as India. You just mentioned India and we'll go there, virtually go there. We'll talk about that in a little while uh, because you have some activities going on there. But let's stay in Basel for the moment. Let's talk about the Museum of Art. You have collaborated with this museum. What did they need you for? What kind of competences you brought to the table and what was the collaboration about? Yeah, I have been asked by the Art Museum Basel of what type of concept a museum could have in the digital age. Because they saw that they have different departments. And in all departments, there is a fast development with many new upcoming machines, processes. And it is difficult for a management to steer the whole uh, development. So they had a lot of software sellers, hardware sellers. Everyone is always greedy to get the latest technology, to be, to be among the first who use a certain technology, whether it's 3D uh, imaging or whether it's take anything in future, it, there will be new technology. So obviously everyone is always very greedy to have the latest gadgets and the latest toys, uh, to say it like that. Mm -hmm. But if you have a house of 450 years experience in protecting print art, the question is maybe less whether you're two years earlier or later to implement the technology. The question is maybe more how we get stable conditions to do so and how we can steer uh, uh, from, the, from the management, how we can steer the policy of a house into digital process. So they saw that uh, their departments and they have different museums, they have a restoration, they have uh, exhibition, uh, they make a lot of exhibition, they have, they publish books, they have a library, archives. So in all the departments, there is a fast change and the management was interested in steering or in understanding what are the possibilities to steer that process in a meaningful sense. Uh, 
So they they heard about me, interestingly, uh, by my engagement in India, in the social field. And I was publishing books with the, or making lithographic works for the director in his uh, previous job. So he knows my way of working. And he had some confidence in me, in the way, in the method of how to work towards quality. So he invited me and asked me whether I would present my view. And it was a, a honor and a pleasure to me. And I came up with a concept that you should steer the whole thing. And you should, the question is, there are many questions, but uh, two of the main questions is what do we digitize in what form and how we preserve it and the other question is how can we avoid unwanted material because see today you have in every smartphone a camera and soon you will have a four key camera in every mobile a smartphone can you imagine how much data will be created can you imagine how much redundancies will be there and can you imagine how in future you want to divide relevant from irrelevant material? So we, the concept I made was built on the experience I have been working with uh, the company of Swatch and of other international marketing companies that it's needed to have clear categories of digital content. Mm -hmm. For example, you can see a watch from the front side or from the side or from the back side, you can have, a, you can picturize a watch with a bracelet, you, uh, you know, with a round bracelet. So as if you wear it on the arm, for example. So you can say, you can figure out there are a few perspectives or how you can visualize material. So the very same is in the art. There's a picture taken of an oil painting, maybe from the front side from the backside, there may be detail images, there are historic images, but if there are historic images, the question is, is it, is it from the front side, is it from the back side? Is it with frame? Is it without frame? So if you analyze the whole thing, you come to a certain category of what is meaningful to have of all your artwork in documentation. And there's the timeline is always moving. So the oldest images are maybe 100 photographic images are maybe 100 year old. And uh, maybe in 50 years, uh, you will make the, uh, again, um, a, a systematic documentation of the same, but you will make it in 3D and whatever. So we made something we called media standard. There are so many standards. And every software developer will most probably every year or every two years come out with a new software version. And the new software version will have a new data format, will have a new structure of data. The file name may be the same. Have a look at, uh, for example, PDF. The evolution of the format of PDF from the very first to what we have today. PDF only means container. You don't know what is in that container. You can have sound. You can have video in a PDF. <laughs> you can have, I don't know, in future, maybe three-dimensional information, maybe even today. So we should be clear that data formats are like containers, but the structure of the content used to be the business of the software developers and of the strategy of software companies. So we usually... They will come out now and then with a new version and everyone who is not able to read the new data format have to upgrade his software and you have to pay for. Now you have uh, software as a service. You cannot even buy the software. You have to get it from the cloud and you have to pay monthly. So imagine what that means. You lose control of all your content. And if you are a museum with 450 years, Art Museum Basel is one of the, early, the oldest, maybe the oldest public museum of the world. So they have been able to control the content of 450 years. But now in the digital age, they are not able to steer the software developers and the, the licenses. And they don't know what they have 
on the server. So that was the main question. And the answer is very clear. You have to define what you need and you have to avoid what you don't need and you have to, to make priorities and you have to digitize all the relevant content in the same way that in five years when new data formats come up, you can migrate to the new formats. So we made a, a structure and we started to train the photographers and had workshops with all the departments. It was very interesting. It took us half a year to figure out what will be the file name. How should be the file name? Because usually you would say, oh, that's not a problem. But if you think in a house with more than 400 years experience, you will have uh, registration numbers and uh, a lot of different number systems and old houses often, uh, they integrate other collections and they have no key to identify a work of art. So the main question is, what is the machine readable way we can identify an artwork and how can we structureize the digital documentation of the same, no matter whether it was done 100 years ago or it will be done in 50 years from now in future. So the structure we built was the same. So things like that we did. So we call it media standard. It's not that we make new standards. The standards are like a jungle. Standards can do a lot of good for you, but standards can be a terrible headache for you because there are so many standards. But uh, we try to keep it simple and and worked and, sp and spoke to many people. For example, the, the scientific photographic department of the Art Museum Basel, which is uh, called today Digital Humanities, and uh, try to make it as simple as possible that everyone understands the need of having a controlled, equal collection of material. And we said there will be a few lighthouse projects. You know, every every museum has got something all the world wants and you want to expose it in the best possible way. But if you would take that standard to document all your one million objects, for, for sure you will fail. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what can serve, say, 99 or 99.9% .9 of the cases, the need of the public in documentation, mm -hmm. if you look at it today. And this will be the standard. Something I like very much of what you're saying that I'm reading between the lines is that even if the big change is motivated, driven by technology, the correct response to it, and your approach in this case, is that of defining what we need very clearly, having clear ideas, clear concepts, because there is a history to be respected. It's not a matter of letting the tech fever get the best of us and always jump on the latest train, but actually respect the history and the tradition of the institution in this case that is going through the transition. It's a centuries long history. The content has always been there. The mission of the institution is that of preserving it and giving access to it. Digital technology can dramatically help that and increase the access, the circulation of the materials. But how do we respect the material. So I appreciate the conceptual clarity very much. And it, again, uh, gives me the impression that you keep being on top of the situation. You're in command. You don't let this tech fever get the upper hand. This collaboration, though, did not just stop with uh, like a consultancy, but was concretized with, you mentioned workflows, um, but also a software tool for the management of this digital data. You showed me that interface, that tool through which several things could be done. And I was very impressed by the resolution of the images and also precisely the number of images taken for each work of art, also across time, 
precisely in uh, five or ten years time uh, we can make a better resolution image and we will or the work of art will be restored and we will also take another picture and not delete the previous so now you create a history of digital images of a work was that like a back-end things for people who work at the museum or our audience could for example go online and and see it it's behind the scenes. It's a it's a tool uh, for managing all the digital content, but it's hidden from the public. But you can see if you go to Art uh, Kunstmuseum Basel or the Art Museum Basel, and you can see the online collection. And I'm very happy that now you can download even in highest resolution uh, the artwork when they are public domain. When the copyright is over, right? You can have the highest resolution of uh, of the pictures they don't they understand it as, as a service to the public and i'm very happy about it i think it's a the right concept is this something you had to discuss with them like were you on the same page to begin with or did you have to have a little persuasion oh, yeah. um to make them open up, so to speak, this high-resolution images, because there is this concept that um, if you deliver digital content online as an archive, as a museum, then people will not come to you anymore. So the content loses value, so to speak. Yeah, that's the fear everyone has. I used to answer like this. See, everyone knows the, the well-known Swiss mountain Matterhorn. And uh, now if the people from Zermatt, which is the town near the Matterhorn, the, the, the mountain, would be afraid that taking photos of that mountain and spreading that photo, people would say, oh, we saw the mountain, we don't have to go there. But the opposite is right. They want to have their feelings standing in front of that mountain or standing in front of the painting Mona Lisa or whatever. But that needs at least an awareness of the importance of this type of artwork if we look at the museum. So if you don't make it public, you will lose ground in public space, in recognition. Others will take your place. So the question is maybe more, what are your individual feelings standing in front of something than whether you saw it or not? I mean, we have art books since long. Does that, Do you think anyone didn't go to a museum because of an art book? I mean, that's simple nonsense, sorry to say. But it is, uh, it's the atmosphere, it's the, the, the now, here, moment. We talked about this exact same concept with Harry Verweyen, who was my guest on episode number nine of this podcast on Europeana Foundation. We said how everybody knows the Mona Lisa, but people keep going to the Louvre to visit it. Of course, because they know it and they, they want to know what is my feeling if, in, if I stand in front of it. Same with uh, a mountain or same with a landscape. First, you have to know and then you get curious what will be my experience? What, be, what will be my feeling when I'm there? So I think that comes back to something we told in the very beginning. We should be aware that our experience will be more and more important in future. And taking the risk to make experience, making mistakes becomes important. Learning from making mistakes. The only thing what will have no value at all and you can't afford to do so, is making mistakes and hiding them, because then you don't get anything out of it. So whether it's a positive or a negative, it's all about your experience. That is different. That makes us different to artificial intelligence, to robots, the, the sum of our experiences. And I think I work often with young people that's what they love because they can make that experience. But when they have to pass tests, if they make a mistake, a mistake, they are out. If you, if we take for example India, I don't know how many people commit suicide because they couldn't pass the exams. They, 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 they deliver bad results in exams. So their future, they feel is gone. So we have a high rate of 
uh, suicides of children or young adults who pass exams not in the way they expected. So they think, oh, my life is gone. And I cannot tell this to my parents. And they invested so much. They invested all their their money in my education. And now I failed. So can you imagine? But this way, I think if we look back, the way of our education system is ideal for the industrial age. We wanted to have an operating system. This was the basic education. And then you packed on it a type of program that was your vocational training or your specialized university studies. But all of this, what you can repeat, what you can memorize and recall in all these fields, computers and artificial intelligence will be far faster, better and cheaper than humans. So the concept of education from the past and the way of selecting the elite was made to have to minimize the error rate and all these concepts i think we have to put in question i think art and social competency ability to solve problems ability to handle with mistakes and to get at least an experience out of mistakes is relevant for the future that are aspects of importance You have mentioned India a couple of times during this interview, Mm -hmm. and I also mentioned that you have some ongoing collaborations over there. I know that you often travel there with your wife, and I would like you to bring us along. Let's go to India for a couple of minutes to hear what's the nature of the work that you do there. I'm interested in the big picture because... We all seem to be moving, right, to this alleged digital future. And I think that it really matters how resources are distributed in the world and how countries and continents are doing today, because this is a gap that will keep widening. So I think it's commendable work that you do in bringing resources and actually helping to organize some work either in Uh, cultural heritage or education and vocational training. So what do you exactly do in India and, of course, with whom? Who is your Indian counterpart? Yeah, we have uh, two trusts in India we built uh, more than 30 years ago. One is called uh, Rural India Self-Development Trust and the other one is called uh, People's Clinic Trust. What we are doing, I think the name points out what we are doing, Rural India Self-Development Trust. So my part is only to support it. All work is done by Indian people and some of them I know since more than 30 years. So we share the aim to upgrade the ability of the rural people, the rural poor, to make better use of their resources. And their resources, it starts with the health. When we started in in the early 80s, Uh, a lot of anemia, a lot of health problems was the problem of these people. They couldn't use their intellectual abilities. They couldn't use their natural resources because simply they have been in an agony and uh, near near death sometimes. So they had no access to vitamins. They had a very unbalanced food and they didn't know about it. And so next step is uh, education. When your health is fine, it's important that you have a sound education that you can uh, understand, that you can read and write, that you can use technologies uh, in farming, which is not destroying uh, the land and creating a value. So the very basic thing, it starts. Wait, what is the first step of this process? Yes. Because we are talking about the same man. (laughs) It feels like two different lives. I mean, it's the 80s and then it's the 90s. And we are in Switzerland. We see you as an entrepreneur. You receive the training as a lithographer and you develop software and you do this kind of thing. How do we jump to... India, um, being aware that there is lack of vitamins and that when your health is good, then you need education. How did you become these two men in one lifetime? Oh, that is a, that is a story. <laughs> Can you I, make it short? short. <laughs> well, I, 
I tried to make it very short. See, I was aware as a young uh, Swiss that I'm part of a very privileged society, like uh, maybe only half a percent of the world's population. We had every possibility. It was in the 70s, uh, in the early 80s. And I understood the privileges I, I'm having will be very rare. So will it make me happy to even grab more privileges or it, will it make me happy by the end of my life when I share some experience, some possibilities, some privileges with other people who have not that chance like I have? And I came to a conclusion that I'm somehow a social being who is only happy when sharing with others knowledge and uh, experience. So I decided to engage myself in India. At the same time, I made the observation that when I engage myself for the future of our society, and that's the disadvantage of rich communities or of rich countries, they mistrust everyone because they reach the type of peak and they think everything we are doing, we always have the chance to lose. So mistrust becomes more and more important fear and mistrust. So this is not exactly what you're looking for being a young man uh, in Switzerland. So I and when I one day I was living in a in a community, we have been all vegetarians. And one day we realized police was controlling our house without announcement and without telling us. So in future, we had to lock our house, not because of thieves, but because of the police and the mistrust of the society and what neighbors are talking and things like that. Uh, so that was an important moment when I realized ah, it seems to be normal. Then when you're rich, you mistrust. And then the possibilities to do something for your own society is very limited because every change will be a risk for your wealth or for your position. So then I, by accident, it will take too long to, to tell the story. I realized that in India it's different. Change means hope, means chance. While here in the wealthy countries, change means risk. So I felt it's rather my way to stand with those people who want to bring a change and have a hope for the same. So I learned about the word nation building. You cannot say nation building in Europe. It's like a bad joke. But in India, in this years, nation building was uh, was something, was a, a mindset to do something for the good of the public. So I felt I will do my part if my friends in India do their part. And uh, still they are my friends. We did the same I did my part, they did their part. And as I'm a Swiss, I don't have to show in India how to work. They know how to work, but they must have the chance to do something meaningful. And they must have an environment that they can make a mistake. And they're not just out because they make a mistake. So whether it's in trade or it's a farmer who tries a new kind of fruit trees, we wanted to bring opportunities to develop their resources while taking some risks in many ways. How many kids have entered these programs so far? Do you have some figures just to give us an idea of the extent of your network in India and what's the size of these initiatives? Like, it's not small scale, is it? It has some impact. Oh, I cannot say we have a school with 1,300 students, English medium. We have a hospital with about 50,000 treatments a year. We have leprosy control in an area of uh, 5 million. We have TB control, and that's going on since gradually it was growing. Now it's rather decreasing a little bit because the government is taking over some of the programs we have to train the government hospitals in that very specific field, we cannot say it must be in hundred thousands. 
Speaking of education, what skills are transferred to these kids to grant them a future, at least in the rural areas of India where you work? I ask that because, again, the mantra in the Western world is that in order to be employable, you need to have digital skills. And coding is, I would say, in fashion. It's, of course, useful. I do code myself. But there are more and more courses for women, courses for uh, kids from 14 to 18 years of age in schools, there is this kind of literacy that is required yeah. and therefore, fortunately, offered. What kind of profile does a young person have in, in India to be employable? What's a useful education? Well, see, it's like this. The Rural India Self-Development Trust has got its own track of development. And that development was, as I told, from... Uh, securing health to upgrading um, innovate. You know, that's only one spot in India. India is so huge with 1,200 million people. Imagine that's nothing what we're doing. It's just on a, uh, on a spot in an area, one small contribution. Uh, that's so big, you cannot imagine. And the need is so high that whatever you do, it's near nothing but it can be a sample and it can change by the experience these people do or by the chances they get with their health with their education in the long run in this area it will have an impact now we have to see on one side we have this institution rural india self-development trust which was growing for more than 30 years and now we think how can we continue And if we think of how we can continue, India then was really different to what we see in India today, mainly in the big cities. The big cities are booming and more and more people leave the rural areas to live in the big cities and they have pollution of air, they have problems with water, traffic mess, everything, but worse than you can imagine here in Europe. So our aim is to upgrade still the life conditions in rural areas and energy is one of the keys. Communication, energy, education is one of the keys. Now our observation is that the structures, the more rural the area is, the more hierarchical the structures are. Uh, And now the the Indian government understands it needs a, a, a major change. It needs a change because India cannot compete in the industry production with China. And India finds it difficult to compete with Japan and with the West because the output of the industry is not on the quality level like uh, their competitioners. So their domestic market works very well, but that's limited. And as I observe, India wants to move away from the agricultural being, an agricultural society to be one of the leading uh, nations in technology, industry, in software, in everything. So that's a whole complex. But what I observe is that the rural areas are not really supported. So if you want to make a career in future, you have to go to the big cities and try to make the career there. Being a Swiss, we know that you have the chance even in small places if the infrastructure, the educational system is developed as it's here in Switzerland. So it can be even a, an obstacle if you are in a too big city because it carries you away from concentrating on delivering quality. Is there a way in which our listeners can contribute to these initiatives? Yes, yeah. So, of course, we always need money, but we need brains, we need engaged people to, su- to share and support our ideas. So, one of the possibilities can be to visit the place and contribute maybe with language courses or with training, co- uh, with uh, giving school, because ours is a, a rural school, even though we have the best results in that district of 5 million people, it's important to exchange with the West and it's important to encourage 
those people who do a brilliant job there. And now coming to BJ Institute, we are rather of a think tank that we have to think how, what we have to do that the next generation, this institution stands strong for the next generation. There is a shift away from a more charitable project to a technology driven project with the 30 years experience to bring awareness, whether it's about health, whether it's about education, now towards ecological question, how we can use solar energy in an appropriate way, how we can use communication technology to escape from this too much top-down driven hierarchical systems to give the chance for a, for a dynamic development of rural areas. There are these are our aims in BJ Institute. So, but we are still in the initial phase. Uh, it will take a while. And it needs the the right partners, and it's so difficult to deal with the Indian government on. Uh, state level as well as on national level because they have a very much top-down approach. They think we need to bring vocational training to 200 million, 300 million in 10 years. So they think, oh, we'll buy the best curricula and we roll it out to millions of people. But that's not the way brings the results as per our experience. I think we need to work in uh, far more with a bottom-up approach to not by the same way of selecting the most brilliant people with uh, learning by ear and passing multiple choice tests. <laughs> the, in multiple choice, in, in a way, we do the qualification today. You will get as a result the best reverse engineers who can... Uh, understand the psychology and the technical needs to organize exams for hundred thousands of people. Those who understand it, those who have a clear look at what, how many points I get by what question and how can I understand what was the intention of the writers of the test, they, they will have the best chance to pass the exams, I tell you, as a, as a chief expert responsible for a qualification process under real conditions. So that is uh, in India even more. So we want to encourage people more like sport clubs in competition, in uh, developing their own abilities. Can you give an example of an activity that the kids do? Um, for example, all the students have mobile phones with weak batteries. So... And in the more rural the area is, the, you have sometimes seven times a day power cut. Sometimes you have only for a few hours a day even power in the system. So when you make the experience with 15 years that you're not depending on anyone, that you can generate your energy for your mobile uh, phone or for your, for your light to read at night or watch TV or whatever, and you are not depending on the electrical company. You're not depending on the school teacher. You're not depending on your parents. That's a learning for life. Then you learned that saving energy is gaining independence. So this type of experience we want to plant in young people that they learn something for life and they can scale then their experience into a, a industrial or into a small scale industry area. If you understand what what volt and ampere, if you understand the basics of solar energy, you can scale it up immediately if you got it. What are the critical factors? So we work with uh, batteries from motorbikes, 10 euro a battery, but it gives you a few years uh, service and panels 10 watt, 20 watt, no, not big things. But then when you limit your consumption of energy, when you understand how much energy is flowing in, how much is flowing out, you understand more than if you learn uh, theoretically about all these aspects. So that's the way we go. And this type of experience we want to roll out. And we have MOUs, memorandums, memorandums of understanding with the local government 
But another problem is in India, uh, government can take a decision, but this doesn't mean that they have the resources and it's complicated in the administration line. So that's the, the, the field we're working in. And all this is to prosecute the future activity of the Rural India Self-Development Trust, moving from health, education, now to developing the local resources. And one thing is for sure, if you look at the big cities like Delhi, uh, Bangalore, Hyderabad, there is a cloud of dust over these cities. And the rural areas have an advantage, one of the rare advantages, if you compare rural areas to the city, is better possibilities to generate renewable energy. So we're going into that field. To bring this interview home, I would like to ask you one last question that I think connects the first part where you spoke about the Art Museum Basel and your work in Switzerland and the second part where we moved to India and you spoke about your work there. There is a keyword that connects these two parts and that is quality. Quality is the keyword that caught my attention when I first heard you speak at that conference in Brussels a few years ago. The way in which you were explaining how you implement your projects made me feel that you were approaching this in a different way, different than the implicit usual way of the first world. So digitization requires lots of resources, skills, people, time. So it's expensive and it's a business too. And it is a good thing that money and also big money sometimes have been put into digitization, including in building large infrastructures. There are some notable examples and that's a very good thing. But where I'm going with this and with quality is that We in the first world, I think, get this misconception sometimes that just because you have a lot of money, you will do a great job. So if that project got a stellar amount of money, then wow, their output will be amazing. And well, that's oftentimes the case for many reasons, but it's not obvious. So just because you have the most expensive scanner For example, in the work in India you just described, that does not mean that your archival copy, the digital master of the original object that you're digitizing, will be of top quality. You need a methodology, you need some principles, maybe there's philology involved. There are many other factors involved that are precisely in a way, not technological. It's about understanding the content. And so I'm interested in uh, hearing you elaborate a little bit on this concept of quality as you understand it in the project that you implement in India, in an environment that's so different from standard Europe, for example, where then the similar or equivalent Cultural heritage materials cannot be taken care of the exact same way. So with limited resources, how do you still ensure quality? How do you define it and how do you implement the project? And also, well, what are the factors that play against that? What are the main obstacles of carrying out a digitization project in India as opposed to, for example, Europe? Yeah, uh, maybe by the things I was telling now, you could imagine that I made a lot of experience in different fields. On the one side here in Switzerland, where investments are not so important, because you can expect somehow they will be there. On the other side in India, where I see that a lot of money is wasted, because they try to act the very same way, like we do, but we have a very stable climatic situation for machines and equipment and this is not always given and then you have people who really believe when they can afford uh, the two hundred thousand dollar scanner and operate the same then this is quality what comes out but if you look at it in practice you will find out that such a scanner immediately will break down because of the dust in the air because of the the fluctuation 
of the energy, then you have to capsule the whole thing. You have to separate it from the power supply. You have to separate it from the dust in the city. And so that comes another uh, $100,000 thing. Uh, the All the infrastructure, you have to use a diesel generator in case of power cut and things like that. So that ends up everything into big spending. And when the project is over, the people did not really learn something. They Because they had been push-button type of work, they, they organized the material to be captured and pushed the button and everything else was just engineering from the machine builders. So we understood that the latest uh, generations of uh, digital cameras are so good that about 10 years ago, you had to spend 1 million or 20 years ago, $1 million to get the same quality. So you have to control the light, you have to use good lenses, you have to control the environment. But this is not risky and the consum consumption of energy is very limited because these cameras are made to be mobile. So they are so well covered from dust and if you uh, use them hanging, mm -hmm. they will not be affected by the typical dust cover. And so I understood with this type of technology, you can digitize from the glass plate of historic photography up to the field work in an archaeological department. Because if you learn factors of quality, and if you learn it from the scratch, you will be flexible. Well, if you spend all your budget to control technical aspects, the people will be left unemployed when the digitization of your ancient material, historic material, is over. So naturally, my aim is to empower the people to rather to train them and rather to give them the opportunity to make their experience mm -hmm. in all ways because they have so many different materials from a coin collection to the documentation of, uh, of temple, historic temples. And uh, so when they understand their tools and the demand, they will be employable in future in other fields. But when they are just push button specialists, they are just depending on the technology they are trained for. So that brought me to the point where I think it's a better investment to train basically and to use uh, long during equipment than to go for too high specialized material, which is depending on many other factors such as dust control, power supply, things like that. And uh, the results are amazing. Because people there then, coming back to what we said in the very beginning, the people then are more motivated. They develop their type of pride because they understand what they do. And if you are just a push-button specialist in a very expensive machine, it's a little bit difficult. You can be very proud of pushing the button on a, on a, uh, on a very costly machine, but that's not for long. Bruno, I would like to thank you so much for taking the time to be on Technoculture. I thank you for telling us a bit of the many different things you do. I always appreciate this attention for meaning, attention for people that you have. So thank you for telling us a bit about that. In the description of this episode, we will put uh, the link to the BJ Institute with your email so people can get in touch with you if they want to contribute oh, please, yes. to yes. your work in India or get more information about your activities. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to Technoculture. Check out more episodes at technoculture-podcast.com or visit our Facebook page at Technoculture Podcast and our Twitter account, hashtag Technoculture Podcast.